Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Many of my viewers requested that I take a look at the netcode of Gears of War 4, so that is what we will do today. But before we get to the specifics of this title, we must take a look at a few networking basics, which you need to know in order to understand the results of my tests. The reason why I include this basic information in every video is that I do not want that someone who is new to those netcode analysis videos must watch another video first to understand what the analysis is about. Also, I've noticed that it does not really work to tell your viewers to watch another video first, which then leads to them drawing the wrong conclusions or they simply do not understand the information which I share in the video. Now, if you already know the networking basics from my previous videos, then you can use the timecode link inside the description of this video to skip that part. Sadly, I cannot provide you with an annotation link anymore because YouTube decided that the new end screen disables annotations. And I can also not use the cards feature to provide you the skip function as a card is not allowed to link to the same video. So thank you YouTube for killing that feature. Let's start with the ping. Now what is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to check the distance to the US submarine with one active sonar ping. The way this works is that your ship sends out an audio signal which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. And on your ship you have microphones which then hear that reflection. If you then measure the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection, then you can calculate the distance between you and the object. The ping that we talk about for network connections is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. Now, when you measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then this gives us the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long the data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes the data to get to its destination, the bigger the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs, which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then this information takes some time to reach the server and then the other client. With short distances between the players, this delay or lag is also very short. However, the bigger the distance between the clients, the longer it will take until they receive an update on what is going on. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which means that you have a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the high ping player can also give the low ping player a bad experience. But that we will have a look at a bit later in this video. So the distance between our client and the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. Which means that our lag cannot get lower than that since we would have to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used to communicate with the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive updates 30 times per second then there is more time between the updates than when we send and receive 60 updates per second. So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where is that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces new data. So when you have a tick or simulation rate of 30, then this will cause more delay than when you use a tick rate of 60, which also allows update rates of 60 Hz then. So the distance between you and the server is what is primarily responsible for the delay that you will experience in an online multiplayer game. Now, which options do developers have when it comes to providing servers? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware and the data center has enough bandwidth to handle all those players that connect to it. Also, when you ensure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can also ensure that no one has an unfair advantage. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game or franchise that builds around the idea to have the community rent and pay for these servers, then the publisher or game studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another problem are the server locations, because when you release your game worldwide, then you must make sure that you have enough server locations to provide all players with low latency servers. If you don't do that, then you create many hyping players and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. 
The other approach is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he becomes the server. With this solution, the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers, which have to be available in many different regions. This also allows that if players from a remote region want to play with their friends, then they can do so at a relatively low latency. The downside is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage, because he has zero lag. Which means that he will see you before you see him, and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. There is also an issue with the lag compensation that I will show you a bit later in this video. Then we also got the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi locally. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most frustrating part of such client to client connections is that if your host disappears, then the game must choose another player to host the match, which means that the whole game pauses for several seconds until that host migration has finished. So, while dedicated servers do not magically provide 100% lag free connections, they still provide the best possible experience in online multiplayer games. So, while you can never be sure if you play Call of Duty Infinite Warfare or Modern Warfare Remastered on a dedicated server, or if you end up in a player hosted match, Gears of War 4 will always put you on a dedicated server in both public and private matches. The only exception is when you use the LAN match option, because then the player who initiates the match will also be the host, as you can't run your own dedicated Gears of War server locally. Sadly the game does not tell us our ping to the game server. We can select the region that we want to play in, but that does not really prevent the game from connecting us to a server that is located in another region, which can happen when you play with friends from different regions, or when there are not enough players inside of your own region who want to play the game mode you selected. So, it would be really nice if Gears of War 4 would show us the ping for every player inside the scoreboard, just like most other multiplayer games do. If you want to find out where the server is located that you are playing on, then you can use Netlimiter to find the IP which shows the highest traffic. And then use a service like IP2Location, which then tells you where the server is located. Sadly, you can't just ping an Azure server because Microsoft is blocking ICMP. But with a tool called PSPing, you can ping a TCP port on the server that is not blocked by Microsoft. And that will then give you your ping to the game server. This also brings us to the server locations. As I said, Gears of War 4 uses Microsoft's cloud service Azure, which has data centers in these locations. However, it's not clear if servers are also hosted in every data center that you can see here. So, if you live near one of those data centers, then your ping to the server will be lower than when you live very far away from them. Now, how about the update rates, which have a big impact on the additional delay that is added on top of our data travel time, or ping. When we look at the network data from a public match, then we can see that every 33 milliseconds my client receives an update from the server, which means that we receive 30 updates per second. When we then look at the data that I sent to the server, then we have a delta time of about 4 milliseconds between the updates which means that I'm sending 250 updates per second to the server. This is a bit strange and it took me some time to figure out what is going on here, as this was the first time that I've seen a game use such an insanely high update rate. So let's have a look at a different sample taken with Wireshark. Here we can see that there are about 7 milliseconds between the updates that I sent to the server, so that's 144 updates per second. While in this capture here we have 16 milliseconds between the updates, which means that I'm sending 60 updates per second to the game server. So what is going on here? While games like Titanfall or CSGO use fixed send and receive rates, Gears of War 4 ties your client's send rate to the client's frame rate. This means that when Gears of War 4 is running at 60 FPS, then it will send 60 updates per second. When it's running at 144 FPS, then it sends 144 updates. And when it's running at 250 FPS, then it sends 250 updates per second to the game server. Only the rate at which you receive data from the dedicated server is fixed at 30 Hz. Which also means that the server is most likely running at a tick rate of 30 Hz. But when you create a LAN match, where one player is also the host, then the host will not use a fixed send rate of 30 Hz. The host send rate is also tied to the frame rate. This means that when all clients run at 144 FPS, then they will send 144 updates per second to the host. 
And when the host is running at 250 FPS, then it will send 250 updates per second to the clients. Now, what kind of effect does this have on the delay that two players experience when they play on the same server? To test this, I use a high-speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection and 144Hz gaming monitors. So to measure the delays between the players, I point my high-speed camera at the monitors and then fire 20 shots with player 2. Inside the high-speed recording, I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 fired his gun and then I count the frames until I see the gunfire on the monitor of player 1. In addition to this gunfire test, I also did two movement tests. In the first one, player 2 jumps and I count the frames until I see the player model jump on the monitor of player 1. In the second test, player 2 moves to the side and then I count the frames until I see his player model move on the monitor of player 1. So usually the games run at at least 144 FPS while I'm doing these tests. But since Gears of War 4 ties the client's send rate to the frame rate, I felt that I should also do a test at 60 FPS. So this test helps us to get a better idea of what the delay is like on console. However, as a result of the 60 FPS, there is more delay between pressing the left mouse button and the gunfire showing up on my monitor. This means that the delay between sending the gunfire information to the server and displaying the gunfire on my monitor might also be greater at 60 FPS compared to the normal 144 FPS tests. So when games do not use a fixed send rate, then this makes it a bit more complex to compare the results. And if more games start to do that, then I need to change my testing method a bit. When I then increase the frame rate to 144 and so the client's send rate to 144Hz, then this decreased the delays as expected. And as insane as it might be, running the game at 250fps on 144Hz monitors did result in another slight delay decrease. So these are the delays when both players join a dedicated server to which they have a ping of 25 milliseconds. Now how about a LAN match, where one of the two players is also the host and where there is no fixed 30Hz update rate? Well, when both the host and the client run at 144fps, then this pretty much eliminates the delay between these two, as 14 milliseconds on average are just 2 frames at 144fps. Now how good or bad are these results when compared to other games? As it turns out, they are actually quite good, especially because the delay is pretty much the same in all tests while in other games the movement has more delay than the gunfire, with the exception of Titanfall 2 where the gunfire has more delay than the movement. I also want to point out that in all these tests both players had a ping of 25 milliseconds to the game server since all these games use data centers located in Amsterdam. This means that you can directly compare the results of these games as the ping of the players was always the same. Now there is one more thing that I want to show you, the issue of receiving damage far behind cover. So we know that when you live very far away from a server, then the data needs a long time to travel between the client and the server, which means that the player might already be behind cover, while a player who has a high ping can still see him. The reason why the high ping player can still hit him is that the game uses lag compensation. If you now think, just remove lag compensation and all is fine, then you are wrong, because that would make the game unplayable even at low pings of just 50 milliseconds. What we really need is that more games finally use sane limits for how much lag they compensate. When we look at Battlefield 4 then the lag compensation causes that the player will get his hit confirmed by the server as long as he has a ping of less than 250 milliseconds. Once his ping is higher than that, the server will simply reject his hit, which means that the high ping player sees the impact animation and the blood splatter, but he will not get the hit marker and the shot will not deal any damage. This is what many players refer to as dusting. So why does the server reject the hit in this situation once the shooter has more than 250 milliseconds ping? As we all know, the distance between the player and the server causes that the perspective of the server differs from the perspective of the player. How much it differs depends on how long the data needs to travel between them or how high the ping of the player is. So when the shooter has a ping of 250 milliseconds, then he sees our low ping player here while the server sees him here, and the loping player sees himself here. The server will stop to register the hit once the difference between where the server sees the target player and where the shooter sees him gets bigger than this. That happens when the ping of the shooter increases to more than 250 milliseconds in this example or when the target moves faster, which is why Battlefield games use two different lag compensation off-frame history time values, one for infantry combat and one for vehicle combat. 
If we would use the infantry combat lag compensation or frame history time value for vehicle combat too, then you would get constant dusting in dogfights because jets move a lot faster than infantry players. A few of you might remember that there was a bug in Battlefield 4 last year in September which caused that exact issue. So I hope that you enjoyed this netcode analysis of Gears of War 4. Now I want to take a moment to thank my patrons, because without your support I would not have been able to provide you with the netcode analysis of Titanfall 2, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, Modern Warfare Remastered, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare and Gears of War 4 in just one month. Your support helps to finance these tests, as I do not get these games for free. Also my tests require that I buy not one, but two copies of each game, which makes the tests even more expensive. Your support also allows me to pay for the subscription and licensing costs of the software that I use to create these videos, as well as other things that are required to keep this channel going. So if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me through Patreon. The link is in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.